Hi, my name is Colin Lennox. I'm CEO of Eco Islands LLC, biomining products, harvest cycler, biosettlers, a whole bunch of fancy brand names for what is a self-organizing wetland bioreactor. And I've been working in acid mine drainage. Uh, I've been uh, so self-organizing wetland bioreactors. Uh, is everybody here com uh, uh, familiar with the term ECLIS, an environmental control and life support system? I guess, okay, great. Uh, this is a component. It is not the all, end all and be all. This is a biological portion of a larger system with a lot of redundancies using good old fashioned, you know, between thermal, mechanical, physiochemical, geoelectrical, whatever else you can think of are in addition to. And the idea here being that these wetland bioreactors are doing the large proportion up to 90% of your base's cycling and regolith processing. Uh, cat and so natural attenuation, that's a term for nature cleaning things, cycling things, biogeochemical kind of cycling. Uh, with manufactured wetlands, and that's a manufactured <coughs> wetland as opposed to a natural wetland or a constructed wetland like are generally used in mine drainage remediation, which is where I cut my teeth. And then uh, also my father was uh, Dr. John Lennox, who's uh, worked in biofilm science as well. Uh, so that's it's kind of came through through the family. Uh, and also thanks, um, shout out to Michigan State University Student Greenhouse Project uh, and Brian Vierstig. He's actually here. Uh, he did the last picture. Uh, and I've seen that used a couple times. So he did that in the background. And then this is one of our reactors. Uh, it's, it's facsimile, it's not exact. Uh, okay, so that's Dr. Bill Burgos. Those are our wetland bioreactors. Uh, they, those are total 3,000 gallons. They're running about 40 to 50 gallons a minute, and this is a mine site that's impacted by iron and manganese. Iron's a piece of cake to get out. Manganese, not so much. Uh, generally, you have to run uh, the pH. If you're familiar with, the, you know, you got your alkalinity and you got your acidity, and the, 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 that balance between those two determines the solubility of metals in solution. And uh, in this case, we've discovered on this very site here back in 2012 originally that if you have wetland components uh, and you get just the right uh, mix of organic matter and flow rate and getting the iron out that you can get out your manganese instead of having to go all the way up to a 10, you can do it at a six and a half. Uh, so a lot of the data that we're coming back with in studies is saying that are, that's actually fungi uh, that are driving out the manganese oxide. Uh, don't want to focus on that too much right now, uh, but manganese oxide is in every single one of your phones right now. That's the cathodes. Uh, and being able to then uh, both solubilize, put it back into solution, dissolve, and then re-oxidizing that manganese oxide uh, in different systems uh, is a really good way to recycle uh, what is one of the fundamental components of the materials that we're going to need when we get up there. And what I'm reading, there's plenty of manganese oxide. Uh, oh, oh, actually, so, um, yeah, uh, yep, uh, those are marked 307s, uh, three series are open lids to the atmosphere, four series are for reducing conditions, and I'll talk more about that later, uh, and then we were, I think I got a world record on this one for manganese removal, it's 360 grams per cubic meter per day, uh, and that's on order of one to two exponents better than any other wetland treatment system, constri excuse me, constructed wetlands using, like, limestone as both surface area and as a pH amendment. Uh, okay, so what is a wetland? This is just real loose. Holds water, uh, produces energetically reduced or oxidized products in the form of solids like the manganese oxides coming out. It's uh, things that we actually mine uh, generally right now, but we can get it out of solution into the boxes. Um, solutes uh, and of course gases, depending whether it's being oxidized or reduced. Uh, you got a lot of biomass and biofilms microinvertebrates, I'm sure tardigrades would fit right into that, but like nematodes and rotifers all within that kind of the realm. You got the, you got the microbes and then you got the next level up predating and then, you know, going up through the, uh, the micro to the macrocosm. And then this is starting at the bottom. Uh, organic matter surface area. I like using shredded up coconut husks, hemp, uh, pretty much anything that is primarily lignocellulosic. Uh, lignin takes a really, really long time to break down. Uh, think of a coconut floating on the ocean and can go for years and then wash up onto another beach and then bam, you've got more coconut trees. Uh, so that's, and that's because it's made out of lignin and it's, uh, it requires super oxidase and a couple other um, really highly energetic enzymes to break the stuff down. And it's, it's not like it's glucose where there's a one-to-one -one 
I won't get too much into that because I am not an organic chemist by any means. Uh, uh, Martin Vander, uh, shoot, I'm forgetting his last name, would be the man to talk to. He gave a presentation yesterday uh, that was excellent on using iron oxides to produce oxygen in a uh, electrical uh, bioreactor. He could tell you way more about it than I could. Um, and then also the big one is it's self-organizing. So these biofilm are self-selecting depending on the influent stream. What is coming in will determine what is going to grow. It's a field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. And as then as the water gets cleaner, it creates what's called a selective advantage for other critters. And then you get a population shift in the biofilm. And then they clean something else. And then they pull that out and you get another population shift and another shift and another shift on until the only thing that's left in the water is essentially salts, which you can then pass through that system and send on to a chloralkali process. Uh, we'll I'll talk about that with perchlorate here in a couple minutes. Uh, okay, so what is biofilm? Mix of microbes and their secreted colloids. Mayonnaise is a colloid. Um, kind of like an emulsion, you know, so, you know just think, think of mayo though, if that's the easiest. Um, and the biofilm remains generally stable in mass and populations, diversity, and their density. So this is, you know, once not, not while they're growing, but once they get to that point where they stabilize within that particular environmental niche. Uh, if you're familiar with the term niche, it's uh, an area uh, where certain microbes are able to thrive and, and continue to exist indefinitely. <coughs> um, deep sea vents, uh, your guts inside you. You know, we're all supported. And, uh, we wouldn't survive without the microbes inside of us right now. Uh, it protects the microbes of this biofilm. Then they're secreting this. It's called EPS or extra polysaccharidal matrix. And there is a whole bunch of uh, chemical, a lot of things that this does. It provides additional um, protection, media for chemical signaling. They're actually talking to each other. I'm, I'm using that term very, very loosely. But there is some inter, inter and intrast, or intracellular communications going on. Uh, once again, actually, Martin just popped in, and he could tell you way more about it than I can. I'm more of an ecologist, remember, not, not a microbiologist. Um, structural support, refuge, desiccation protection, they don't dry out as quick. Uh, and host, uh, host complex redox reactions, that's reduction oxidation. That's handing off electrons from one, uh, from one reaction to another. Remembering conservation of energy and mass. This is, it, <laughs> I'm not very good at math, but this stuff is pretty easy. Water in, it pulls some stuff out. Water out, there's your rate. Really simple. I actually went to school for English and environmental studies, so you know, no PhD here. Um, but so then we got wetlands. You got biofilm that are in the wetlands. So what is a bioreactor? It does predictable and reduce, reproducible work? Because uh, you got to get that work in there. It's it's doing something. This is an intentional system. Uh, it's a biological engine, essentially. You've got gases, you've got, uh, well, I won't get too much into it right now, but you've got all those components to get work done. Uh, it, the law, of course, law of conservation of mass and energy, uh, catalyzing, produce, or, uh, producing useful byproducts uh, most of the time. Sometimes you've got to be careful. Sometimes the byproducts are uh, not some things that you want. Uh, and I'll um, say like hydrogen sulfide. Uh, in some methane reducing reactions, but then once again, I'm not going to get too deep into that right now Because I couldn't tell you a whole heck of a lot more than that. That was really more my dad's end and unfortunately He's not with us any longer to tell me again what it was but uh, so going through the intentional bioreactors natural wetlands things that we look think about when we look at the Chesapeake Bay or uh, out into uh, um, the San Francisco Bay Self-selecting and organizing once again, there's that natural attenuation, but then intentional bioreactors Constructed or manufactured wetlands. So a constructed wetland is uh, like we've got in Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. That's where I, uh, once again, do a lot of my work in massive mine drainage. Constructed wetland, you've got a bunch of track hose, and you dig a big pit, and all the stuff goes in there, and you throw in a bunch of spent mushroom compost. And in 20 years, 15 years, you got to do it all over again because there's no good way to clean out what is essentially a big lake. And then what are you going to do with all that stuff? Say you've just pulled out a whole bunch of selenium. That stuff is dangerous. It'll kill you. Uh, uh, we all, you still need it for uh, protein synthesis and uh, DNA synthesis, so it is a micronutrient. Not having it would also kill you, uh, but there it doesn't like the, the threshold is tiny before it really starts hurting you. And there's a lot of people in, you know, a lot of U.S. citizens still in West Virginia are being impacted by this daily. Uh, so there, but there's not a lot of, never mind, I'm not getting into the politics of it. Um, and then there's so constructed wetlands, large, but they're effective, and this is 
been the standard for the last 40 or you know, up to 50 years, but there haven't been any real significant changes uh, up until, you know, I'm going to toot my own horn here, the manufactured wetland, which can be, you know, an order of one to two exponents more efficient, which means it's way smaller, which is, okay, maybe that's something we want to take to Mars, something that we could print right on Mars, made out of plastic, made out of regolith and glaze. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that you could do to uh, put them together once you get there. So in situ resource utilization through things that you made with ISRU, uh, just continuing then spiraling up, going for that exponential growth phase, potentially maybe eventually terraforming. Because uh, I haven't heard a whole lot about that at this conference yet, so I wanted to give a little plug. Uh, okay, um, shoot. Okay, uh, specifics and by, by example, uh, it's my dog River, love my bear. She didn't even notice that turtle because she's got a thing for like looking at uh, light spots. Uh, Nick up there, uh, my last intern just put out, Nick is six foot eight, so he's um, standing over a box. That one is a 1500 gallon, uh, we call it the Mark 415. Uh, well, actually that's a 315 because that's not a sealed lid reactor. Uh, and that, was, that one was designed and built four years ago, so we're significantly beyond that. Uh, and then we've got a 3004, uh, which I eventually ended up sealing up and then you'll see more about that later on, but that's a, uh, you know, just the idea of the scaling. Um, but natural wetlands, methane digesters, reclamation ponds, fish tanks, greenhouses, wastewater treatment plants, wine and beer vats, uh, every single person standing here. Depending on how loose you want to go with that definition on what a wetland is, we kind of count. Uh, okay, so uh, it's my good buddy Andy. He helps build some of those reactors there in the background. Uh, so that's that same Mark 3004. Uh, and that was back in 2016. We took that one to uh, Miwa in uh, Albuquerque, or excuse me, uh, uh, Las Vegas, big mining convention. Uh, and then that is a recirculating 100 gallon Mark 401. Uh, and that one has entirely individually sealed comp or, uh, uh, different chambers so that you can allow for a gas, essentially a gas distillation. Anybody here uh, familiar with the Winogradsky effect or Winogradsky columns? Oh, okay, we got at least one. It's, it's, you take a bunch of pond muck and you put it into a column and you let it sit and then it will sort itself out biologically by you've got oxygen at the top and then you've and we'll, we'll talk more about the electron acceptors later but nature has a way of self-sorting Winogradsky columns and th th it's a little bit like a, a gas distillation system but you turn it on the side and then you've got individual chambers each going more and more and more reduced and then driving off gases or sequestering the solid forms of those materials within that box. So it's essentially, it's a biological distillation process. Uh, they actually got the patents for it back in 2013 and we just filed for the internationals as well. Uh, okay, so this is a low pH iron system. This is another Mark 307, 750 gallon unit. Uh, that is pH, let's see, it was going in at about, we, we found actually this cool thing is the faster you run them, the better they work up to a point. It's like going down the highway at 55 miles an hour for wind speed and you know the the best uh, gas efficiency, um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to matter whether it's fungal, archaea, uh, or what the kingdom is that is functioning. It's so far it's pretty consistent, 60 to 70 gallons per minute through that specific size reactor. And here's here's eight of them right here. Uh, this actually system uh, was a very early system. We I don't know if you can see we're still using pipes before we went onto the weir based system. It worked for a little while, but then it was very difficult to clean it out. So I consider it a failure and you redesign. We ended up going back to uh, scratch and went to the weir based system and then uh, put in clean out manifolds and now we've got bubbler systems. So look at science, you're gonna have some failures. That one cost me a client though, because we're a business. So these are the things that you learn. It's okay, you just you pick yourself up and you keep on driving. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, and I live in Altoona, PA, so it's great to be able to be right in the middle of some of the world's worst pollution. Yay. Uh, and then uh, West Virginia, uh, and that was iron and manganese in that system. We can get the iron out, but then we couldn't get the manganese because we ran out of space in the boxes. That's essentially what happened. If you're pulling all the iron and you got to have your iron out first, you pull all the iron out, but there's nothing left for the manganese. That happens. Uh, a larger system. And also the, uh, the, the property line is about... 10 feet beyond those boxes so we didn't have any more space to work with and it was on the back end of the hills just what it is 
Uh, okay, so um, there's a whole bunch of benefits here, and these are both with hard data from what I have done in the past, and then also just kind of extrapolating and the hypothetical and what stands out there in the literature. Like I'll talk about perchlorate. I have never done perchlorate because, thank God, there isn't any of that around Altoona. We got screwed with the AMD, but at least we don't have perchlorate or selenium uh, or what's PFOS. We don't have any PFOS either. But those are they're all bioremediation pathways. And that's the big, that's that's generally speaking, that is the science of what I do. It's called bioremediation to clean up pollution with life. Uh, so big thing is, and uh, I have to give a shout out to Martin. Dude, I rewrote most of this presentation after talking to you last night, so thank you very much. I think it flows better. Uh, and one to two exponents in energetic savings, because if you can have gravity run boxes run off of just one or two pump systems, then you've got the ability to save all that additional energy for other things. I mean, you can, you can run one or 100 boxes off of one 300 watt uh, pump, especially on Mars where you don't have as, you don't have as much head pressure to fight against. Uh, there's there's some downsides as far as that uh, goes that I can talk about later. But so one to two exponents that's the that's the expectation on the overall uh, energy consumption on the base because you're also getting a whole lot of products and doing the cycling where otherwise you would have to do RO filtration ozone electrolysis, there's a whole lot of other means that you could get there, but by tacking this system or a bunch of wetlands onto the front end of any one of these systems, you can get, I figure, up to 90% of the work done, and then you do the polishing with those, those more technologically or more energy intensive other systems. So it's, it's, it's not by itself. This is to add on to let this do all the heavy lifting for essentially free. Uh, let's see. Um, and and how is it doing that? Uh, more nat there's there's more space for the natural cycling uh, in a much smaller space. Uh, generally about uh, 50 to 150 times smaller, uh, and that's coming from data from uh, Glasgow. That was that 360 gallons per minute. Sorry, Glasgow, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Didn't go to Scotland. That would have been great. Um, but that, those, those are from the hard data of comparatives of here's a constructed wetland doing two to 20 grams per cubic meter a day, or well, they're, they're even calling it square meters a day. So it, it's not even very specific. If you've got a five foot limestone bed, and it, it, it's not apples to apples directly. But then we're doing 360 cubic meters. That's why I like cubic meters because it's just, it's more direct. You know exactly how much volume you're dealing with. That's something I could pop into the ISS. Not saying a full cubic meter or anything, but it gives you something to work with. Uh, okay, um, so once again, those are, so we learned after island seep failure, uh, we started putting in manifolds and put that in here two years ago. That is a Dietrich site outside of Blairsville, Pennsylvania. And then we buried that, by the way, that's just for detail so you can see it. We uh, ended up putting pipes in uh, around the, the ball valves. That's all four inch fittings, everything that you can get cheaply, locally, essentially. You know, you go down to any pretty good hardware store uh, or larger hardware store, they're gonna have that. And then just to give you an idea, so, and I don't have a pointer here, but that box would take up exactly, is taking up this much space. It's about the size of my fingertip on that larger site that's several acres. And last data set that we had back was actually, it ended up being our best, and we were pulling a fifth of all the iron on that entire system. And that's a low pH iron system. Uh, it was like three and a half kilograms a day. We were running about 30 to 40 gallons a minute, 80 ferrous or so, 80 milligrams of dissolved iron. Uh, and then uh, we dropped that down to, it was, it, I think we pulled about 15 to 16 milligrams per liter in the time and the residence of about 25 minutes that was going through the box. Just to give you, a, so I mean, it's real time as it's moving through. And in this, in this, this site then, if we were to have, say, about another four boxes, <coughs> we would get the bulk of all the iron out. And then we would essentially be able to remove all this and replace it. So that giving you, gives you an idea on the footprints of what we're working with. Uh, and a manufactured wetland can do pretty much everything a constructed natural wetland can and a bunch of things they can't, like I'd mentioned uh, methane purification uh, by driving off the hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sul I don't know if anybody here has ever played around with methane digesters, um, but yeah, it's really stinky. That stink, hydrogen sulfide and mercaptans. But if you can drive that off before uh, be uh, you, you get to the final step of methane uh, production and then you're also gassing off CO2. Now you have a possibility of directly injecting that into a pipeline because the nasty stuff, and hydrogen sulfide will also burn. It doesn't matter when you're actually like cooking over, over top of it. It's just stinky on the front end, but it is highly corrosive uh, to metals and other things. So if you can get that out, now you've got essentially natural gas. 
but without the, uh, the, the downside of it. Um, I haven't personally done that yet because we're still uh, working on getting those first of uh, the Mark IV series reactors put together, but I hope to be able to say next year that, hey, guys, we got it. Um, let's see, it's a throw th <coughs> flow through pulse or batch reactors. Batch reactor, wine vat, you know, here. Uh, pulse tide pool, I think like a tide pool, coming in and coming out. And this is one of the things I was thinking might work for Martin, uh, where you have a system where you, you flood it, you've got your reactions, and then it pulses out again and constantly going backwards and forwards as opposed to a consistent flow through system, uh, which is what the boxes are designed to do. Uh, constant flow, that way you can take whatever flow rate, uh, scalable and modular, all year long, all through the winter, because you, it can't stop. I mean, you know, my clients are paying us to make sure that they're in compliance and the DEP isn't breathing down their necks, which means it's got to run all year round. Uh, you know, five degrees outside, it better still be running. And they do, because when you got a lid on the box, they just don't freeze. As long as you're running it fast enough, a couple gallons a minute is fast enough to keep it from freezing. And it's pretty it's pretty simple, but it's not it's not necessarily obvious off the bat. Um, let's see, you can adapt to the load as it changes in real time. Uh, and of course, that's one thing about mine drainage is it's going to change. If it slows up, if it uh, uh, slows down, speeds up, temperature, uh, maybe the load changes underground and you just hit another pocket of, more, uh, of uh, uh, iron pyrite, which is where most of the uh, fool's gold, if anybody's familiar with that, that's what's creating most of acid mine drainage is that oxidation and breaking down that iron pyrite. Produces a bunch of acid, dissolves everything else in the load, all the other metals, blasts it all out, and then it just comes out in streams, wiping out 20, 30 miles worth of streams. That is that is acid mine drainage. Welcome to Appalachia. Um, but things change. But a wetland can adapt because it's self-organizing and selecting. So in our in, in the boxes, and this is you know we can watch this happening. As you you'll end up getting it's kind of like a standing wave in a river. If anybody's done any kayaking, you got one big rock out in the middle of the uh, the, the the river, and sometimes it's a class three, other times it's a class one, and you can just go around it. But it, you you see a wave that's constantly changing depending on the flow, and what this means is those where the material falls out in the boxes is just moving forward or backwards. So uh, as opposed to say a batch reactor that may just outright fail, this at least has an opportunity to adapt to environmental conditions. Uh, provides a broad range of services and products dependent on biofilm and loading. We'll talk about that more later. Um, so once again, Student Greenhouse, uh, they, uh, we're, we're gonna be the water, part of the water recycling system. Now we're only doing like the, hand washing water or something like that so it's it's essentially clean water so it, it's not really going to do them a whole heck of a lot of good but we did get a box in there so they'll build that in a couple years uh, and it'll be 150 feet tall or no 75 tall 150 wide uh, and I've got more pictures as we go once again six foot eight Nick um, but low energy cost so that's one solar panel and that was running that box at 17 gallons per minute at 10 foot ahead pressure but it had to be full sunlight one more $250 panel would get it would get it running pretty much all season, all year long, and probably have enough to uh, charge a DC battery to keep it running even into the night a little bit. Uh, and that was uh, at my friend Andy's place. Uh, and he's got an animal sanctuary, and he's also one of our sales reps. So I had a spare box. Actually, that's one of those ones from that si uh, the site that failed. We just fixed it and put it here because we had it and it was free. Might as well. Uh, so, uh oh, just, uh, but of course now you'd need more solar panels on Mars or some other source, but just to point out that you know, 0.6 kilowatts of solar is nothing compared to the megawatts that everybody else is talking about. And that one pump could run one or a hundred boxes. So just keep that in, you know, it's, it's that um, spiraling up system. Uh, okay, another greenhouse. Uh, so uh, yeah, ex uh, accepts the mixed waste streams and be, uh, actually that's kind of a duplicate. Automated, monitor, command and control. We're just about to the point where I can just see everything that's going on from a system right now with just an app on my phone through its uh, Hawk. Uh, or the, uh, they build very good scientific and monitoring equipment. I love Hawk, H-A-C-H. Uh, -H. Um, and for an extra 10 to $15,000 per box, you can just see it on your phone, but then, okay, we just had a snowstorm. I can't even get to the boxes, but you can command and control, you can monitor. And just like the last gentleman, uh, very redundant based systems where you can save on that labor time because it always comes down to these guys that I sell to, they're miners. They don't care about the water. I mean, 
none of them want dirty water. But when it comes to what they have to pay and they got to send somebody out to take care of it, then it becomes an issue. It's got to be able to take care of itself as much as possible. And if it can automate command and control, now you've got a system that's also got its own electrical feedback systems, or well, not electrical, but electronically based feedback systems, that if something starts going out of whack, the, it can tell you or it can control itself. Uh, and one of the big things is it being able to flush because with these heavy metal oxides that we've got going into our systems, it is easy to get it into the box. It is difficult to get it back out because you've got many, many, you know, hundreds, in some cases, hundreds of kilograms of material over a couple months worth of time. Uh, and that's, that can be very difficult to get out, uh, you know, especially if it is in like January, nobody wants to go out there and sump out a box. Cause I've done it a lot of times and it sucks. Uh, so being able to have a system that can each individual cell self flush itself and then we've also got a bubbler manifold that lifts all that coir the material to the top breaking everything loose and then flushing out uh that has been uh that that has gone to the point where it's saving us we're an exponent down in maintenance from where i used to be a couple years ago because of the new systems because it always comes back down to maintenance they don't care about capital expenses it's operating expenses uh, convection and conductive heat sinks, you got a lot of water. Water has a very high specific heat. That means it holds a lot of energy. That's why our oceans are constantly um, determining and, and, and buffering the, the heat flux of our, our atmosphere. Um, let's see, uh, and also that, of course, that increases metabolism, which increases remediation to a point. Uh, there's, there's the solubility of oxygen and water you gotta take into account, but usually 65, 70 degrees, spot on anything above that you're wasting energy uh, but then you can also dump waste heat into these systems if you need to without losing it in the open environment if you want to hold on to that energy for something else uh, decentralized infrastructure that's one and this is one of the big things this is why we're talking to some very large organizations right now that right now everything is gigantic batch reactors made out of steel uh, and they have 10,000, 100,000, a million people, all their waste going into one treatment facility versus why don't we just have 10 homes and four boxes that will take care of the bulk of their, the, the waste processing, uh, including pharmaceuticals and in some cases antibiotics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, long term, uh, okay, so yeah, long term though, if you can do one to two exponents in energy efficiency, uh, then now we're getting into the range of terraforming when we're actually thinking about regolith processing. And this is after, you know, this, this is the, uh, what's planetary protection has gone by the wayside. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not making a political argument one way or the other, but there's no way, I would bet anybody here a case of beer that the methane, di that we will find meth methanogens, methane producers, that's why we're seeing the methane that we're seeing right now. And I would also not be surprised if the pathways are pretty much the same as the same critters you got here. Because those are, those are metabolic pathways that are, in some cases, three and a half billion years old since uh, Mars had water. So I would be willing to bet that it's this, we're going to find very close to the same critters. Uh, so there's already life on Mars. What do you, what do? You do? Um, okay. Problems. Because nothing's perfect. Uh, so issues that we're coming across uh, is uh, terrestrial, transferring terrestrial biofilms. Will they even take over in Mars? Are there certain circumstances, like you, you think about some really touchy, rare plant, and you can't seem to take it anywhere out of its own niche, and, and then get it to grow, get it to reproduce again. We're probably going to run into that, I'm just saying. Uh, that, that's, that is going to be one of the biggies that we have to worry about. Um, let's see, and water weighs less. Oh, was that the one I talked about already? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, that went really fast. 50 50, okay, water's ways. Uh, uh, gee whiz. Terminal electron acceptors and donors. So that was the big thing. The, if there's a takeaway, by getting self-organizing wetland bioreactors onto Mars, it's going to save us a lot of energy, and it's going to produce a whole bunch of different products. Uh, to, um, there's the redox ladder, methane oxygen and the boxes are essentially just allowing you to drive all the way down through there and keeping the O2 out. Um, that's how it works, why it works. Um, things that you can do to change that that's more of a maintenance and manual thing. That's not important. Student greenhouse, primary functions, secondary and tertiary functions. Um, the prime functions are the things that they do best. And there's in some cases, the only thing that can do a certain product uh, being produced. Uh, clean methane generators, CBOD uh, for uh, agriculture. I've built um, 
couple of these for cannabis grows now, and it's a carbon dioxide generator. We breathe oxygen, so does a wetland. Uh, Winogradsky biological effect, hospital wastewater, perchlorate. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it there. Any real quick questions? Real quick. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Colin Lennox.